Well, good morning, everybody. Glad to see you today. Thanks for uh, making Compassion part of the first day of the week for you. I hope that it's going to be a great start to your week. I hope that uh, by being here, you receive something that you'll receive something that's going to lift you up and take you and propel you in your faith. Uh, I, I want to welcome everybody who might be a first-time guest. If you are in that category, we're glad that you're here today. You are a blessing to us and uh, an answer to our prayer. If you would do us a favor, if you would take a few moments and fill out the Connect card that's found on the inside of your worship folder, that is a way for us to, to just keep track of, uh, the, uh, of who is coming, and we would love to connect with you in that way today. If you'll fill that out, uh, hold on to it until the end of our time today, and then as you're leaving, there is a desk out uh, in the lobby. It's called the Connecting Point Desk, and if you'll drop it off there, uh, we would love to just uh, give you a Starbucks gift card in exchange for that. So we, we're glad that today you've chosen to be with us. I also want to look into our camera up here and say good morning to everyone who's watching on Facebook. For those who are members of our church who are traveling today or you're away, thanks for tuning in in this way. We hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to you as well. Uh, I, I want to give a, uh, just a word of thanks to everyone who made our fall carnival a success yesterday. Uh, there are so many of you who donated food items you, uh, you helped us out with uh, manning the, the different stations. You showed up to volunteer. Uh, and it was really, a, in my estimation, a great success because it allowed us to connect with people in our community. We, we had many different conversations with people who are looking for churches. They're new to the community, and they're trying to make a connection. And what better way to come out and uh, to just uh, allow them to have a, a low-pressure type of setting, a totally free event that was uh, because of your generosity. So I want to thank Thank you for that. It was a great success for yesterday. I want to thank all of you who volunteered, uh, all of you who donated, as I said, and especially I want to thank Kelsey Ralston for uh, leading that. And, and getting that off the ground. So we're, we're appreciative of that. Uh, a couple of other things I want to let you know about uh, that are happening. Uh, we're going to have uh, a Connect reception for anyone who is new to our church. Maybe you've been around here for a little bit. You haven't made a connection yet and you want to do that. We're having a connect reception on the 17th of November after, the, after this service. So it'll be from 12 o'clock to 1230, a very short, brief time with a lot of information packed in. And we'll have some snacks. You'll have a chance to mingle. But we want to help you get connected to a group or connected to service. And uh, the, the guest, uh, anyone who's a guest is welcome to come, but certainly anyone who is a newcomer, uh, to our church. So that Connect reception, you can sign up for it by going out to the Connecting Point desk and put your name and your best contact information because we'd love to, to show you how you can get involved in our church. And then um, you might also see in your, in your announcements uh, on, on your insert, we have a new series coming up in November. It's called The Family Table. And this is a series about relationships, the relationships that are going to be renewed when you sit around the Thanksgiving table uh, that's coming up. And, and I want to give you a new perspective on relationships because I think the secret is instead of hoping and praying and trying to get other people to change in your life, the only thing you can really change is you and your reaction to when other people get on your nerves. So we're going to talk about that during this series, and so I hope you'll join us for the family table and more on that in a couple of weeks. Uh, so today I want you to take your Bibles. I want you to open them up to the 16th chapter of Proverbs. I want you to also um, find your message notes so you can track along with me today as we're talking about unmasking pride and what pride looks like. Um, and so I, I want to tell you about a time when I let my pride get the best of me. Now, I, had, I have a, a, a variety of stories I could tell you about the times that pride has gotten the best of me, and some of them are very embarrassing, so I think I'll reserve those for maybe another time. But I remember uh, there was one time when my pride got the best of me in a couple of ways. I was driving one early morning after, uh, after getting the kids off to school, and I was driving down to Worthington, to attend a meeting of different pastors in the area, and we met down at Worthington Christian Village. We, had, we would have a breakfast. We usually have a program, and just a way to hang out and see what God is doing in other churches. And so I had stopped that morning and got myself a uh, McDonald's sandwich and a, uh, a Diet Coke, and I had the lid on it, and, um, and so I, I'm drinking it, and at about the time I get down to 23 around Lewis Center, all of a sudden I, I'm putting the drink to my mouth, and it spills, and the top comes off of it, and all of the, the Coke, or Diet Coke, goes into my lap, and I'm wearing khaki pants that morning, all right? So it goes in my lap. I am on my way, almost in Worthington, to go to this place, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? So 
I decided, you know, I'm right there by the, the big super Walmart right there on 23. So I said, well, I'll just go in there and I'll, you know, I'll assess the damage. And so I got out and I had to untuck my shirt because it literally looked like I had peed on myself. And so I'm walking through Walmart with my shirt down and I'm going back to the bathroom and I, and I look and I assess the damage and I realize this is pretty bad. So I had a couple of options. Number one, I could just go home and not, not show up that day, which I was tempted to do, but I really wanted to connect. It's always a good thing to do that. And so I went into the Walmart bathroom and so I started trying to dry my off. So I took water and I started patting it down, you know, and it just made it worse. It made the stain even now. The, the pants were a little lighter hue than this. And so I keep patting it down and then I start standing in front of the Walmart mirror. So imagine all the people coming in and seeing me standing under the mirror, uh, under, the, under the blower like this. And I'm standing there and it's taking a long time. I'm going to be late to the meeting. And so then I had another thought. I'm like, well, why, why not just go uh, into, the, into the store and buy some khaki pants and just go from there. Now, in that moment, I am not, uh, I'm not proud of the fact that my pride got the best of me. And, you know, I had like Old Navy pants on. And, but I said to myself, well, I'm not going to go buy pants from Walmart. I don't want anybody to, like, see me, you know, my fellow ministers. I'm not going to go buy pants. From, that, that was a thought that came into my mind because I have been, you know, conditioned to think, you know, you just you buy the best when you can and, you know, just go from there. But my pride got the best of me. But here I am, a mess. And what am I going to do? I'm going to walk into the minister's meeting. Hey, guys, no, I didn't pee on myself. I just spilled some Coke and I got what They would never believe my story. But I was too proud in that moment. So what I ended up doing is just going home. And I, I came back home and I let my pride get the best of me because I could not lower myself to wear pants from uh, purchased at Walmart. Now, ridiculous. I've made purchases from there before. I remember having to buy a, a shirt or two. I've even bought some pants from there since then. But in that moment, I wasn't, I wasn't uh, shining, uh, a shining example of humility. And so, you know, what, what I want to talk about today is pride because I think for, for you, you can probably recognize times in your life when your pride has gotten the best of you. But when I start talking about pride, what we normally do is we, we are always more able, I think, to spot and identify pride in other people, right? Like we can look at people and say, oh, what a jerk. That person is full of themselves. I don't want to be around them because really prideful people can get on your nerves. I mean, we know of people too proud to ask for advice, we know of people too proud to ask for directions. We know of people too caught up in their, their wrong ways that they're so bullheaded about it that they would never take advice. I mean, there are people who are always one-upping others, right? They've always got to be the best. People who love to go on and on and on about their accolades and their accomplishments and all of their awards. And far too many people get obsessed with themselves. And really, we're looking and thinking, there's really nothing for you to get obsessed about. You, you really shouldn't be this high on yourself. So pride is this mask that we all wear, and yet we always want to identify it in other people. And the reason we do that, I think, is like the most recognizable form of pride is what we would call narcissism. You know, a narcissist is someone who literally like clinically can be diagnosed as having the inability to think about anyone other than themselves and really to the, to the harm of relationships. Like they literally choose uh, th for their own good, even though the consequences for other people could be very devastating. And so the most recognizable form of pride is narcissism. And narcissism makes us think that we're truly God's gift and God's answer to everything, right? They have to be the center of attention. Uh, they dominate every conversation. As it's said before, they want to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. So you know what a narcissist is, right? So they, they dominate every conversation in every room they're in. They have to stay on top <clears throat> at all costs, and they cannot celebrate the successes of other people. Now, if you are a narcissist, you are going to have to get some clinical help to get through that before you will bow your knee to Jesus. I, I really truly believe that, and I've seen that enough, that if you are a clinical 
uh, diag- you have a clinical diagnosis of narcissism, it is not going to be easy for you to ever have healthy relationships until you get help and you bow your knee to Jesus. But I would venture to say, even though there might be some narcissists in this room, and I'm not here to play your, your therapist today, I think that there are more people in this room who are not in the category of an egomaniac or a classical narcissist, but it doesn't mean that pride hasn't snagged you in one way or another. Ironically, most of us don't want to see ourselves as prideful. Like we're, we're like, I'm not prideful. But really, in many ways, pride is like the cardinal sin. It's the originator. It's like the, it's ground zero. Pride is the hallmark of foolishness. Pride uh, it causes us to be foolish. And foolishness is basically unapplied knowledge. A fool will know, but yet they will not care and they will not act. And the reason it's important for us to talk about pride this morning is that if you leave it unaddressed, it's going to destroy the relationships you have. It's going to destroy your career. It can destroy your spiritual life. And the collateral damage of pride is is, is pretty bad too. It's going to affect your compassion. It's going to keep you from being empathetic. It's going to create division and make you think that all is normal in your life. It will turn you into the kind of person that you hate. And even if it doesn't do that, it will poison your relationships. That's why I want to read to you today from Proverbs, a very classic passage on pride and arrogance. And here it is in Proverbs 16. Here's what we we read. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be lowly in spirit along with the oppressed than to share plunder with the proud. So what I want to do this morning with you is I want to look behind the mask of pride and then I want to figure out how we can take steps to being humble. But let's begin first of all with looking behind the mask because pride actually shows up everywhere even in the least likely of places. Pride sneaks in on us even if you're insecure. Even if you are an insecure person and you think, well, I am the least likely to be prideful because I am so unsure of myself, I have a really terrible self-image, I struggle with doubt, Uh, maybe even you struggle with self-harm, maybe there are things about your life that you think there's no way pride could ever reside in my life. But here's what I want you to understand. If your insecurity, which basically is never thinking that you measure up to your standard or God's, it actually can create this unhealthy focus on yourself that you're always thinking about how bad you are and how others see you and and how you're not succeeding, and it can cause you to have pride in your life. So here are some signs that I've recognized in pride that I think are, you know, you can see in Scripture, and and then we're going to talk about how we can get rid of that. But, But let's talk, first of all, behind the mask of pride, how do we, what are some signs of pride in your life and mine? The first one would be comparison. If you've ever found yourself comparing your life to other people, you're normal, right? You're in in great company if if you feel that way. You and I have lots that we can learn from other people. But you see, when we're insecure, we're not driven so much by a desire to learn as we are a desire to track with others and compare ourselves as a result. Like we want to know how we are doing. So one way of tracking with others can be healthy and the other way can be destructive and there's a lot of sin involved. Here's what we do. Here's how I think it goes wrong. Uh, the first way is that we compare ourselves to others who have it worse than we do. So when you compare yourself, you're not always comparing yourself to those that you aspire to be like. You're actually comparing yourself to people who have it worse than you do. As an example, you would say, well, you know, uh, I'm going to pick out and pick on someone who is lower than me. And so pride will compel you to say, well, I may not have my dream body, but at least I don't have the health problems of old so-and-so over there. Or you would say, you know, I, I'm not the highest degreed person in my department, but I'm smarter than most of them. Or I'm not driving my dream car right now, but at least my car's not dented and scratched like my loser brother-in-law's is. You select people in your mind that you can outshine. Now, one counselor actually coined a term for this, and it's called comparagance. Comparagance. It's the arrogance born out of compassion. 
Uh, I'm sorry, it's the arrogance born out of comparison. Sorry, I'm getting my words mixed up here. Arrogance born of comparison. So the fact that you may be afflicted by this, you know, don't be surprised by it because it's our, it's our human condition. And what makes it worse is that we live in a world that says you don't stack up favorably until you identify and look like us. You don't stack up favorably until you have this or that, you have this position, you have this possession, you have this person, and you don't measure up in that way. So comparisons can actually cause us to be prideful. You can totally go from an inferior mindset to a superior mindset because you think, well, I'm better than other people. So you compare. The second way that manifests itself is that your self-worth is determined by your performance. Your self-worth is determined by your performance. Now, how many of you you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you would say, you know what, I am definitely a person driven by results. I set goals in my life, uh, I, I make sure that I hit them, and, and if I don't, I really feel badly about myself. So if you're addicted to progress, if you're addicted to results, and you get alarmed when things are not going the way you want, you could be in this category. Now, there's nothing wrong with being ambitious, there's nothing wrong with being driven, as long as you're doing it for the glory of your Creator and not for yourself and for your own ego. Because one sure sign of insecurity is that your opinion of yourself rises and falls on how you perform or what others say about you. Now, for men especially, I found that, that men, we tend to tie our identity to our work. Like we, we tie our identity to our occupation and, and who we are. In fact, I like what Tim Keller said about it. He said, when work is your identity, success goes to your head and failure goes to your heart. You see, that is why many men, when you know, they, they lose something that seems so important to them, that's when they, get, they, they fall victim to despair and even suicide. You see, if your work, though, maybe is not your particular poison, you substitute whatever else you have tied your identity to, and you'll see it. Maybe for you, it's your physical appearance. You've always tied your self-worth to your physical appearance, or you've tied your self-worth to your bottom line financially, or you've tied your self-worth to what others say about you. Whatever it is, when you fail, that failure can go to your heart, and when you succeed, that goes to your head. So let's figure out a way to balance that out, all right? So don't tie your, your self-worth to the latest progress report that you've made. You see, here, here's what I want you to understand. Secure people take issues seriously. They just don't take them personally anymore, all right? So, so there is a difference between taking things seriously and taking things personally, you should work hard as for the Lord in whatever you do, but yet you don't always take things personally. And then here's the third sign of someone who might be masking pride. They cannot celebrate someone else's success. They cannot celebrate someone else's success. So insecure people usually struggle with celebration. Like, first of all, they can never celebrate when they do well because they think, well, there's the next mountain to climb. There's the next goal to hit. There's the next thing to do. So I can never celebrate that. And then to make it worse, they also get threatened when they see other people in the same field or uh, among their peers succeeding. And they're like, well, why am I not doing as well as he or she is doing? And so we start to, we start to think that, that we're not, we can't celebrate other people's successes. So here's what I want you to understand. If you are insecure, someone else's victory means your loss. And someone else's loss means your victory. It's, it's a, no, a zero-sum game, right? It's not going to make a difference. If someone else does well, you, cannot, you can't help but wonder, well, why didn't I get the same results? Why didn't I have the same outcome? And so you, you want to feel good for others, but you really can't. So insecurity will lead you to focus on yourself and not other people. Here's another way that you can see if pride is being, uh, is being in your life. There is no room for gifted people in your life. There's no room for gifted people. Pride is threatened by the gifts of other people. We, we do it all the time, right? Maybe there's someone in your life, like right now, that you can think about. It's your sibling. It's a relative. It's a coworker. It's a friend from high school, and you have intentionally drifted from that relationship because you have seen their star rise, you've seen their life go on a trajectory that you want, and you don't want to be around them because you don't want to hear about their kids getting into Ivy League schools. 
You get sick of talk, hearing them talk about their vacation home or how many trips they're going to take. And so you distance yourself from them because you don't want to hear that. You see, if you find yourself envious of others who are more successful, then, then they're, that's, a, that's an issue of pride. Proud people always feel a need to be the most talented or the most skilled. And as a result, the number of gifted people around them becomes much lower than it is around people who are secure and less obsessed about themselves. And then here's the final one. You want to control everything. You're a prideful person when you feel as if you've got to control it. Insecurity drives you. You will always feel like you've got something to add to every conversation, every story that someone tells, you've got a better story, and you're going to trump them. You're going to always add your opinion, your knowledge, and you never feel good unless you've had input on every single thing. You may even tend to be a know-it-all, whether you're really knowledgeable or you're just making stuff up to make yourself feel better, right? The truth is, I think that everybody in this room, we could go pew by pew, uh, chair by chair, and I could figure out, okay, you're probably good at one or two things. You're probably good at one or two things. Like you are maybe an expert at these things, and then you know, you're really good at that. And then on the other parts of that, you need to understand, if you are an expert at what you do, if you are really good at your field, your avocation, your hobby, whatever it is, it's because you have received encouragement and support and love and understanding from someone else. Because you have, you have received counsel and training, and you've, you've, you've achieved that, right? But if you think that you're prideful, if you think that you've arrived there, your, your pride is, is going to hold you back. Now, you don't have to look very long to find out uh, examples of people who are wanting to control everything. Think about politicians. Uh, think about business leaders who let their success go to their heads and get toppled by pride. I mean, leaders every single day get ousted because uh, they don't listen and, and they, they're caught breaking the rules. Or uh, politicians get defeated because they're seen as entitled or out of touch. But, you know, we like to look at it when pride affects other people, but when it affects us, it's different. I mean, you know, if a pastor makes headlines these days, it's usually not positive, is it? A pastor makes headlines today, it's because of a moral scandal or financial impropriety or something has happened. And so it's usually for something bad, usually but not, uh, usually but not always, right? So how do you battle pride and remove the mask? How do you make sure that you don't end up with a story that you don't want to tell? How do you make sure that you don't end up on the wrong side of a story that someone else is telling about you? How do you do that? Let's talk about today the habits of the humble. The habits of the humble. How do you tame pride, uh, as, uh, this, this beast that comes in all forms? You really do it simply through humility. Humility. Nothing kills pride like humility does. In fact, one person said, only humility can get you out of what pride got you into. That's what's going to happen, right? Pride, humility gets you out of what pride got you into. So how do you become more humble? Like after you listen to this message today, are you going to wake up tomorrow more humble? No, you're not. I'm not going to give myself that much credit. <laughs> what's going to have to happen, though, is you're going to, you and I are going to have to put into practice the actions of humility that will eventually lead to the attitude of humility. And I want to talk about how we do that. Uh, the first one um, would be you need, uh, you, you need to get humility in your life. Okay, that's the overarching answer is get humility in your life. But how do you go about gaining humility? Well, I've found in my experience there are three ways you get humility. Number one, you cultivate it as a discipline at a very young age. In other words, there, there might be the rare person in this room, for some reason your natural disposition has always been to be reserved, quiet, humble, and shy. And you are, as a, as a natural part of your giftedness, you are a humble person. Well, congratulations to you. The rest of us envy you. And in some ways, we hate you, all right, if you have humility that way. So that's one way, and very rare. The second way you get humility is through humiliation. Now, this is how most of us get it, amen? Through humiliation. To be humiliated is to be humbled, not by your own choice, but by circumstances or by another person. For example, being fired from your job, declaring bankruptcy, getting dumped by that significant other, 
are all potentially humiliating experiences. Maybe your child got into legal trouble and everything is tied to you, and so you were humiliated. Anytime you feel embarrassment and humiliation, pride is lurking in the wings. So humiliation is involuntary humility. Humiliation is involuntary humility. It comes to you when it's the last thing that you want. So what happens? We fall flat on our face. We get surprised. We get upset. We get brought down low. And when you've fallen flat on your face, you can't go much lower, can you? I mean, you can't fall off the floor. So when you hit rock bottom, when you're at your, your end, you come to the end of yourself, you usually learn the lessons of humility. You learn humility through humiliation, except that you didn't really choose to be there. You were forced there, and the danger with humiliation is not in the act of being humiliated. Now, hear me clearly. The danger with humiliation is not in the act of being humiliated. The danger is that humility is easily abandoned and forgotten. Once the the sting of humiliation goes away, we dust ourselves off, we we look around and we, we hope that no one was watching, that no one remembers. And so we soon forget the lessons we learned when we were at our lowest in humiliation. And then humility starts to go away. You see, the danger is that humility is easily abandoned. You can brush it off as soon as you brush yourself off. It's far too easy to get up and walk away and not remember the lessons you learned from it. And I think that is a, a lesson wasted when we forget what we learn in humiliation. When the humility we learn there, when we got brought low, what do we learn and what are we going to change? You see, I don't know about you, but I want to put as much distance between me and humiliation as I can. And I want that to happen as quickly as possible. Humility stays only if you invite it to stay. Remember, it's the action of humility that will lead to the attitude of humility. Even more than that, you need to submit to it and crave it and develop it and nurture it. And otherwise, it leaves and pride returns as soon as the bruises on your knees heal. That's what's going to happen. So that leads to the third and perhaps most universal way humility arrives and stays, that you invite it and you cultivate it. You invite humility into your life. You learn the ways of the humble, and you make it simply your principal way of operating. If that happens, then pride doesn't have any room to stay, let alone grow. And that is difficult because humility is not attractive to the people who need it most. It's just not. Pride looks far more appealing. But think about it. Pride looks attractive only to the proud. You don't like proud people, but you love humble people. What you need most looks unattractive, but what others hate in you looks most appealing. So how do you know if you're humble? How do you know? Well, if you monitor your actions in different areas, then then you'll be able to to adopt that, and then your, your attitude will follow soon after. So even if your heart continues to be a mix of pride and humility, which it probably will, Your actions are going to demonstrate the unity uh, of of thought in your mind that, you know what, I am finally learning what it means to be a flawed person, and yet I can be be humble. So I want you to look in your Bibles in James chapter 3. This is where we're going to look to see what I think is uh, a great word for us this morning. James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. In James 3, here's what he says. He says, who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now go back to verse 13, and that's the key phrase, deeds done in humility. Deeds that we do in humility. And so what are some of those deeds? I've, I think there are a lot, but, but I just want to offer you three today as a take-home. The first one would be 
take the low place. And by that, I mean take the low place in your relationships. Take the low place. So for most of us, we remember back during the time that, that we started on the low end of the totem pole, whether at school, on the social strata, or at work, we started at the bottom, wherever it is, think back to the time when you started and you had nothing And remember when you were a student and you were starting out on your own, you lived on a diet of uh, ramen noodles and ramen noodles warmed over. And maybe you used public transportation or you shared a car and you dreamed of the day that you would own a beater just so you could, you know, that would be an improvement. There wasn't a lot of pretense about you back then, remember, because you didn't have a lot to brag about when you were just starting out. I love hearing stories of people uh, who in their marriage, you know, they started out and they said, all we had really was love. We had a, a card table as an eating table. We had a, a coffee pot or we had a warming, uh, one of those little warming things to warm up our, our soup. That's all we had. I love those stories because they remember what it was to start from humble beginnings. But you know what happens, especially in a culture like ours where there's a lot more success on the middle class, uh, on the middle class level. Maybe you've experienced success at work. And you started to notice that your lifestyle improved a little bit. You had a starter house, and then you moved up to another house. And, you know, now it's, you found that you're in this cycle of, you know, I've got to keep improving. I've got to keep upgrading. I've got to do all this. And, and that can be heady stuff for a while. But think about your humble beginnings and where you started from. And remember how, how much you lacked pretense. Think about those days. You see, pride makes us start to enjoy titles, corner offices, praises and perks, first class service, front of the line uh, service and everything that we do. The prideful always want to take the high place. They always want to take the high place. They always want to to be revered and fawned over and recognized. They're, they're, They're just one of those, they love titles. But on the other hand, humility, humble people, shake off titles. They take the low place. They're intent on serving rather than being served. They don't mind doing the grunt work. They don't mind putting a towel over their arm and serving. Nothing is below them. So here's what I want you to hear. Taking the low place does not mean that you will always occupy a low-level position at work or in other endeavors. Now, really, when I say take the low place, I'm basically talking about in your human relationships. Because if you take the low place at work, eventually your, your humility and hard work and genuineness is going to be recognized and you will rise through the ranks because people want to follow a humble leader. So humble people are often recognized for their gracious hearts and their diligent service. So what do you do if you've kind of figured that out and you still get the perks that come to you because of your position? I'd encourage you to think about sharing that with other people. Share that with your coworkers. Share that with people who are busting their tails and yet they're not getting recognized and show them a little bit of love and mercy and, and help them through that. So here's a discipline. Share what God has, has given to you. So take the low place. The second thing that I think we would do uh, is to never stop learning. Never stop learning no matter what your age is, no matter how much you've achieved. Because unchecked, pride is going to blind you. I mean, have you ever thought that you've gotten to a point in your field that after a while when somebody tries to give you advice, you start kind of like rolling your eyes and like, what does he know about that? You know, I've had to watch myself sometimes because I've had, you know, younger preachers say, hey, why don't you think about, you know, doing this for your illustration? Or why don't you think about talking without notes? And I'm like, Psh, why do you know, man? I got books older than you. You know, that would be easy for me to do. And, and, and I've had to fight that because I've not always successfully navigated that the right way. But that's what pride does. Never stop learning. Never lose your spirit of teachability no matter who you are or where you are. One of the greatest examples of this is a man that I consider my mentor. He's the pastor who married uh, Michelle and I back in 1989. He is leading uh, Compassion Christian Church in Savannah, Georgia, that meets at like four or five different locations. They're running around uh, 9,500 people. An unbelievable church that is doing great things. And every time I've ever seen Cam Huxford at a conference where literally he could be the keynote speaker on every on, on, for every conference, he, is an, he could lead a Fortune 500 company as a CEO because that is how gifted he is. And yet every single time that I see him at a conference, he always has an open notebook and he is just writing furiously. He's writing copious notes every single time. 
Now, why would a man who has achieved what many would say is like the pinnacle of success, he's recognized throughout our country as just an expert on topics like marriage and raising kids and church growth and relationships between church leadership, why would he ever think that he could learn something from someone else? It's because he has humility. And he has that posture of the open notebook. And so I think that's a great analogy for us to take. Maybe for you it takes the form literally of an open notebook or it takes the form of just being open, having your heart open to be teachable and learn something from someone, especially when it comes to spiritual things. So uh, I, I just love that about him. And then the third thing would be, the way to apply it, would be to put other people in the spotlight. Be okay with putting other people in the spotlight. Pride has to be acknowledged and recognized and fawned over and celebrated. Sometimes pride will have you believing that you actually deserve everything you get. Sometimes it will convince you that you've been overlooked and the world does not recognize the treasure that is you, at least not yet. So as a result, pride results in us wanting to hog the limelight. Want me to make a keynote presentation? Absolutely. Want me to speak on this matter? I'll do it. Want me to spearhead this project? I'm the right person. Whatever it is, we always say, I want you to see how valuable I am. So if your insecurity is driving your obsession with self, pride might make you think, well, it took me so long to get here. I deserve it. I've earned it. Humility does not think that way at all. It willingly pushes other people into the spotlight. It's never jealous. It delights in the success and the successes of others. In fact, sometimes humble people even enjoy others' success more than they enjoy their own. One example of this I found is that uh, several years ago now, uh, my wife and uh, family and I were in Indianapolis for a, a Christian conference, and the hotel we were staying in just so happened to be hosting a, uh, like a, I guess, a, a camp for college basketball players and coaches. And so I remember getting on the elevator one, one day, and I recognized the guy who was on there as a, as a coach I had seen who's coaching college basketball, and I said, hi, are you Tony Bennett? He said, no, uh, my name's Dick Bennett. Now, Tony Bennett was his son, is his son. If you follow college basketball, Tony Bennett is a strong follower of Jesus. He actually is the, the coach of the University of Virginia Cavaliers who just won the national title back in March. Okay, so Tony Bennett is a strong believer, and I, I'll never forget what his dad said when, when I mistook him for his son. Now, years ago, his son had nowhere near the accolades and accomplishments as his father, but he said, he said oh, that's okay, people do that all the time, but I am, okay, I am very happy to be mistaken for my son. And so I look at that now, and I think it's that type of environment of humility that Dick Bennett had to say, you know what, I've coached more wins, and I'm teaching my son everything that I know, but he isn't me, and I'm not him. But instead, he said, I am more than happy to put him in the spotlight. And friends, that is what happens when we love other people so much that we will be humble enough to put them on the platform and in the spotlight and on the stage. That doesn't make us less valuable to the organization or to the family. It makes us more valuable. And that is a lesson in humility that I want to learn. So when you're humble, you realize that there's more important missions that are out there than your own personal gain and your reputation. So let's take off this mask of pride and let's be humble before our God because after all, he knows everything about us and he still wants to save us. So let's pray together today as we close. Father, I pray that today we would share the stage and help others succeed, that we would be more humble and not more prideful. God, I pray that we would see uh, in the examples of scripture, in the examples of people, of people all around us that Humility is certainly the path that leads us to, to where we need to be in your eyes. God, I pray that today our pride would not prevent us from admitting the areas that we need to change and where we need your mercy and your grace to be poured out on us. God, I, I ask humbly in the name of Jesus that we would come face to face with our pride in its various forms and confess it to you this morning right now. God, I also pray that our pride would not prevent us from um, admitting that we need you and we can't save ourselves without you. So Lord, use this time as we sing this commitment song to draw us near and help us to bow our knee to you. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So don't allow the pride of your sin and your